Okay, so hi everybody. I am delighted to welcome Jane Kirtley from the University of Minnesota here. Um, we're gonna be talking about a really important case and one that Jane was personally involved in. So I um, feel very lucky to have this tremendous background. Uh, so Jane, why don't you start us off telling, um, telling us why the Department of Justice versus Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press is a truly important case for us to understand. Well, this is a critical case uh, for freedom of information in general, but for the privacy exemptions in particular. Um, it's hard to imagine when we look back um, to the world in 1989, how concerned the court was about the idea of a centralized computerized criminal history database that was being maintained by the FBI. I mean, it seems very quaint to talk about it now because we take it for granted that that kind of material is being collected. But at the time of this case, I think it's fair to say that the Supreme Court was really freaking out at the idea that there was this government database to which the public did not really have ready access and which, as Justice Scalia said during the oral argument, really meant that if you were Jean Valjean and you had chosen uh, a stolen a loaf of bread, that many, many years later, someone would be coming after you. I mean, that was the picture that the court was painting about the implications of giving the public access to this kind of database. Another thing that was going on at the time, because I was executive director of the Reporters Committee when this case was going on, and I was out speaking to a lot of different groups, including, I believe it was an organization of state attorneys generals or law, law enforcement or something like that. And one of their arguments about why there should not be public access to this database was that it contained a lot of mistakes. Mm -hmm. And I said, but you know, you rely on this database for your purposes. So doesn't it trouble you that they are not uh, entirely accurate? They said, oh, it's all right. We know how to handle it. Well, you know, I don't know about you, I don't find that very reassuring. To me, the whole concept here is that by allowing public access to this database, it's one of many forms of oversight, citizen oversight of what the government is up to. Um, we'll get to what the government is up to and its significance in FOIA in just a second, I think. Yeah, so I think one of the reasons that this case is sometimes overlooked um, in, in the media law world is that um, FOIA is so it's so difficult to tackle. It's kind of like, I, I often liken it to um, to fair use with students. Like I'll give you the basics, but it's much, much harder when it comes to application. So tell us a little bit about the background of FOIA and, and how it's sometimes, it's hard, sometimes hard to deal with. Well, this uh, statute is an outgrowth of frankly, uh, Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal and the proliferation really? of federal agencies. You know, uh, before, FDR and the New Deal, there really weren't very many uh, cabinet level agencies, but they exploded um, during the whole National Recovery Act period. Um, up until the enactment of the Freedom of Information Act, there was really no way for the public to get access to the records that were being maintained by these executive branch agencies. You could use the Administrative Procedure Act, but it was not particularly helpful. And there was no clear expectation that the public should be able to get these records. So a number of members of Congress and also open government act, uh, activists started agitating Congress to enact a law. And of course that was a little tricky because that's the legislative branch telling the executive branch what to do. But over the years, uh, they finally came up with the, the prototype for the Freedom of Information Act. And it was signed into law by um, Lyndon Johnson um, on the 4th of July, um, reluctantly. Um, he didn't want to sign the law, but he was basically pressured into doing it. Since then, the law has been amended roughly every 10 years. Um, and one of the most important changes involved um, updating it to deal with electronic records because the law itself was drafted at a time of paper records. And, and that's what it talked about. And it talked about physical possession and things like that. And as uh, the government started to digitize records, there were records custodians who said, well, the Freedom of Information Act doesn't apply to these digital records. Or they would say that 
to provide somebody a digital record was really requiring them to create a record, which the statute specifically says they do not have to do. They have to give you existing records, but they don't have to create records. In other words, you don't ask a question, you ask for a record. And if that record exists and it's not exempt, they have to give it to you. So there's been a lot of that over the years. Sometimes I think, you know, just an accident of changes in technology. Sometimes, in my opinion, frankly, in bad faith on the part of the government. But things like affirmative disclosure, putting records that have been frequently requested in the olden days in bricks and mortar. Uh, federal reading rooms, now mostly online, have all really been aimed at making it possible for people not to actually have to use the Freedom of Information Act, mm -hmm. that they can just rely upon affirmative disclosure. And, you know, there are people in government who think this is a great idea and are, are very proactive about doing it. But when the first digital amendments came in, the big issue was who's going to pay for all this? You know, we're going to do these things. Now, who's going to pay for it? Or who's going to, um, you know, deputize somebody within a department to handle all of this? So serious resistance along the way. And frankly, not all that many people in Congress who cared about it because most of their constituents don't care about it. Uh, Patrick Leahy of Vermont has probably been the most consistent champion of freedom of information during his long career. Um, but for most other people, this has, has never really been a priority. And in fact, just as kind of an aside, the uh, JFK assassination records were sealed for a very, very long time. And it's actually kind of relevant to the Reporters Committee case because part of the reason was that they said that these records don't really belong to the government, they belong to the Kennedy family. And so they were trying to keep them under wraps until Caroline Kennedy and, and others um, die. What happened, and this is the only time I've ever really seen this happen, when Oliver Stone made his movie, JFK, which obviously has a lot of speculation and right. fabrication in it, but it captured the public's imagination and people were contacting their congressmen saying, we gotta have these records. And so I've always said that Oliver Stone probably did more for open government than you know, all of the other people that have been laboring in the vineyards all these years because he captured the popular imagination. They demanded a change and, and it was enacted. I can't say that I foresee that happening again anytime soon, although we'll see. Um, the, the release uh, you know, in September of uh, 2021 of uh, some of the records relating to the 9-11 attacks is something that may whet the public's appetite for more uh, records. I was just going to mention that 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 these these big moments like the 20th anniversary of 9/11 uh, seem to do that, seem to cap capture yeah. the the um, popular imagination and say, well, what does the government have that they're not telling me? So That's give right. us just a just a, a quick insight into what this case was about, um, DOJ versus Reporters Committee. Okay, well, so a, a reporter who was working for CBS at the time by the name of Bob Shackney um, had read a report that came out of the Pennsylvania State Crime Commission. Um, this occurred at the time of a big government contracting scandal that involved a congressman by the name of Daniel Flood. The Pennsylvania State Crime Commission report said that one of the contractors that was implicated in the scandal, Medico Industries, that they identified the medical industries as a legitimate business, but one that was dominated by organized crime. Hmm. So Bob Shackney said, well, that's really interesting. I wonder if that's true. And he wanted to get access to the Medigo brothers. There were three of them initially, and they started dying off, but there were three to start with. Um, I want to get their rap sheets, their criminal history records, which I know the FBI has in their centralized computerized criminal history repository. So that, that's what started all of this. He simply wanted to see what the documentation was to support this statement that was made by the Pennsylvania State Crime Commission. And um, the FBI refused to release them on the grounds that doing so would violate one of the nine exemptions to the Freedom of Information Act. It's, it's exemption 7C, which says that release of these records would reasonably be expected to constitute an unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. So what this case evolved into was a basically a fight over whether releasing criminal history records 
was a violation of somebody's privacy. That, that really was ultimately all that it was about. But again, because it was computerized, there was this additional wrinkle to it, um, which the court kind of obsessed on in, in its opinion. And do you think that was ultimately persuasive? Because a lot of state level battles have been fought over access to criminal records. Um, and, you know, arrest records largely are de- of adults are largely deemed public. Um, they're, they're public matters. It is, the, it is the state that is arresting an individual and citizens of the state should have access to that information. What, what shift? Why, why is this about privacy and not about public access? Well, um, kind of to cut the, to the chase, in the r- words of Justice Stevens, who wrote the opinion, um, this is all about a concept that I think the Justice Department dreamed up and the court adopted, which is something they call practical obscurity. And it was based on the idea that criminal history records, as you said, are generally public at their source. And in fact, had Bob Shackney wanted to take the time, he could have driven all over Pennsylvania and gone to every county courthouse and looked up the court records and found out what the Medico brothers' criminal history was. But he said, but the government's already done this for us with their tax dollars, our tax dollars. Why can't we go ahead and see it? So um, what Stevens wrote in the opinion was that because these records were available in scattered sources, maybe all over the country, that most people would reasonably assume that nobody would ever find them. And that's what he called practical obscurity, that even though they were kind of hiding in plain sight, most people would never look at them. And he said this idea of practical obscurity created what he called, I think wrongly, an expectation of privacy. Hmm. To me, these are not private. This is not private information. In fact, it would be very dangerous if it was, because one of the things that protects us from government overreach is that the public has access to things like arrests and convictions and stuff like that. We, we know what's happening to our fellow citizens. But what Stephen said was that it creates an expectation of privacy and that only a very strong public interest would override that expectation of privacy. Now, I mentioned that the Medico brothers, they had rap sheets going back to uh, the bootleg era because they'd been involved in this for for their entire careers. Um, By the time this case was being litigated, they started dying off one by one. And as they did, the government released the records for the most part, uh, could no longer claim privacy because under the Freedom of Information Act, privacy is only supposed to attach to someone who's alive. And so once they were dead, that was no longer, they could no longer cite 7C. There might have been other exemptions they could cite, but they could no longer use that one. So we did get some of the records. I say we, because the Reporters Committee joined with Shackney to litigate this case um, through the DC federal courts, uh, where we had kind of a mixed experience, but obviously we, we won in the DC circuit and it was the Justice Department who took the case to the US Supreme Court. How did you feel at the time about the decision? Was it surprising to you in its unanimity? Well, it was surprising only in the sense that uh, going into it, I thought we had a really good case. But during the oral argument, as I was sitting up there at the council table, I didn't argue, but I was at the council table. um, My stomach just started sinking to my shoes because it was pretty clear which way the wind was blowing. Um, as I said, Justice Scalia was very outspoken about what he saw as the implications of the release of these records on, on people who perhaps had either paid their debt to the society or been wrongfully arrested or something like that, which did not apply to the medical brothers. I mean, they, they were organized crime up to their eyebrows. Um, but again, I think the idea was that the court was just really disturbed by the idea that all of this was being maintained in this Uh, computerized repository and that in theory anybody could look at it. But to me it's illustrative of what I think continues to be a a great issue in the area of access to particularly computerized records, which is not so much the access itself, but what use someone will put the records to in the future. And if the court doesn't like what you're going to do with it, even if it's perfectly legal to do it, that may become a justification to close off access. It, it makes me crazy as a general proposition because I see it all the time in state and federal um, 
policy, open government policy discussions. Um, my simple answer, and maybe it is simple, is to say, if you're that bothered about this use of these records, then prohibit the use, but don't close off access to the records with the idea that you're gonna stop somebody from doing something that you just find troubling. I mean, a simple ex example, the, something that happened here in Minnesota had to do with judicial records, but the principle is the same, which was that uh, people were trying to get remote access to um, criminal uh, conviction information and things like that remotely. Again, that, that was the point. And the argument was, well, if people get that, then they're going to discriminate against uh, you know, convicts in housing and jobs and things like that. And my answer was, if you're bothered by that, then make that illegal, but don't close off the access to the records. But the Reporters Committee case was kind of the beginning of this because um, not just the executive branches around the country, but the judicial branch too, has invoked the Reporters Committee many, many times in contexts that frankly, I don't think the Supreme Court anticipated for this concept that um, there's this practical obscurity that we're destroying with digitization of records. In other words, something that we should be celebrating, ease of access to government records. Um, we're creating, we're, we're declaring it, it's the bane of our existence and, and it has to be shut down. So. This was the really perverse result of the Reporters Committee case that I'm still feeling quite guilty about, although quite honestly, I have to say, we did not anticipate that it was going to go this way. It seems so obvious that if you're, and I should mention that back when Shackney began the case, he was asking for everything on the Medico brothers in the rap sheets. But as the case evolved, we tailored the request to only that information that was originally derived from public records. So in other words, if they had something that law enforcement had gathered through an informant, we weren't asking for that. All we wanted was the consolidated record that they had gleaned from public sources. And the fact that they would say we couldn't have that was just something that I had never anticipated. I remember it being striking. I was very, uh, I was just out, just out of my first media law class at the time, and, and I remember being really struck by the unanimity and and sort of forcefulness of the of the decision. Um, is it a good example? Maybe not the earliest example, but a good example of technology being ahead of the court and the court not yet ready to conceptualize what this means. Because to be honest, in in this age, you know, in the in the in 2021, we're speaking. The idea of um, this practical ob obscurity is just kind of funny. <laughs> it's like kind of well, kind of quaint. You know, I, yes. I I mean, I think you know, it it was in one sense sort of ahead of its time as a question, but it was a serious uh, policy issue because as this digitization was taking place, agencies were using that as an excuse to withhold records, sometimes on the, again, the spurious argument that it would be creating a record. But in this case, the privacy issue is something that, you know, there's another privacy exemption one exemption as, as well, exemption six. And um, we've seen this utilized over and over and over again. I mean, it's, it's the gift that keeps on giving. And as I said, still is cited a lot um, among policymakers as, as they're refining either their open records laws or even access to court cases. And I, I keep thinking that as, you know, the judiciary legislatures, you know, get younger, they're gonna be more comfortable with uh, databases and so forth. And are not gonna see it as this horrible big brother kind of situation, but um, it's not happening as fast as I would have thought. I mean, this case is from 1989. We're talking ancient history in many respects, and yet it's had considerable staying power. And I guess I should mention quickly that the other case, uh, more recent, the um, uh, Favish case, um, brought against the National Archives, which back in 2004, which involved access to Vince Foster's suicide scene photographs that were taken at the, um, in, in a park outside of Washington, DC. Foster, for those who don't know, was uh, an aide to in the Clinton administration, the president administration. And he committed suicide. Um, of course, this was something that all the conspiracy theorists in the world glommed onto, you know, Hillary killed him, you know, Bill killed him, somebody killed him. 
Um, there were several um, investigations done, including one headed by the Clinton's very good friend, Ken Starr, uh, which concluded that it was indeed suicide. And the government was basically closing the book on it, but there were still people who were convinced that it was not true. So they wanted to get access to the photographs of the crime scene. I mean, it, you know, taking apart the fact that this was Vince Foster, a, a Clinton aide, this was just a crime scene set of photographs. They released some of them, but not others. And the argument was unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. And the reaction to that by me was, what? <laughs> you know, the, the, the reporters committee case made very clear that once somebody was dead, they no longer had a privacy interest. And that's why the Medico brother files were released over time. Vince Foster sadly was dead. So what's the problem? And what the court ended up doing was coming up with this, in my opinion, totally bogus interpretation of the Freedom of Information Act's privacy exemption to say that it extended beyond the record subject, in this case, Mr. Foster, to include his family members, his mother, his wife, um, because their, their privacy would be implicated, even though they weren't in the photographs, there was nothing identifying them in these photographs, but ultimately it came down to the fact it was going to distress them. That, that's really what it was. Um, the Scylla Center that I, I run at the University of Minnesota did a friend of the court brief in this case. I felt like it was a command performance because you know, I had to come in and say something about how crazy this argument that uh, the, the Art National Archives was making was. And I said, as when I was working with my students, I said, you know, we're, we're probably going to at most get a Pyrrhic victory here because if the Supreme Court agrees with my argument and that of, of Mr. Favish, that um, what will happen will be that Congress will go back and amend the Freedom of Information Act to create this familial privacy idea. But although I don't like that, I would rather have it in black and white in the statute mm -hmm. than just something that somebody makes up. So I thought, okay, and I said, and we got to frame this in a way that'll appeal to Justice Scalia, because he's a strict constructionist, literal reader of the statutes, and we got to point out there is nothing in the statute that says this. In fact, there's nothing in the legislative history that says this. And during the oral argument, Scalia actually did ask the government attorney exactly that question, you know, how, where, where are you getting this from? And what it ultimately came down to, and, and I remember, gosh, I remember all, it was another one of these cases where watching the oral argument, I thought we're going down on this one. Um, people like Justice Breyer and others were, were very, very sensitive to the idea that um, protecting family members from seeing distressing scenes of their loved one's death um, was something that was so inherent in Western culture that, um, of course, Congress intended this kind of an exception. Mm -hmm. And the concern was that the photographs once released, and of course, this is true of the Freedom of Information Act, once you release the photos, you have no control over what happens to them. And they said they're going to end up on dead celebrity websites, and this will be very distressing to the family members, and, and we, we don't see a justification for releasing them given all of these government investigations that have already taken place. Um, you know, had there not been government investigations, the answer might have been different. But they say, you know, five different committees have looked into this and concluded that it was suicide. So you requesters should just take that and go away. So sadly, um, we now have that additional case, which specifically bootstrapped from the reporters committee to, uh, case to expand the, the interpretation of the privacy exemptions. Really interesting about how uh, concerns about family distress take hold in that case, but don't matter all that much in a case like Snyder versus Phelps. They weren't persuasive, it, you know. It's it's, a, it's true. Just, yeah. it, it's I, it's sometimes uh, marshalling uh, toward the end that you want <laughs> through the logic. Well, I mean, I to me it was just such an opportunistic kind of argument. Now, granted, the Favish family, or I'm sorry, the Foster family had specifically, you know, gone to the law to, to the government said, we don't want these photographs released. But in our brief, we kind of speculated about, so there's going to be one rule for people that have, you know, vocal family members and another rule for people that don't. Um, some people don't have family members, but they have 
friends to whom they're just as close? Did those people get a say in this? It, it just seemed to us to be an unworkable rule. And um, the, the, but the problem, timing is everything. And part of the problem was that this case arose at the same time, a couple of other things were going on. One was that um, um, service members' remains were being brought back from the Persian Gulf. Mm -hmm. And the government argued that if these photographs, these crime scene photographs were released, that there would be no argument to not uh, provide photographs of open caskets and things like that, which was nonsense. But that was what they argued. And the other thing that happened at the same time was that Dale Earnhardt, um, the auto racer, uh, was killed in the Daytona 500 at the same time this case was going on. Um, you probably remember that there was a big battle in Florida to try to get access to his autopsy photos because there was an argument that had he been using a safety device um, that was now being gradually added into the, the, the racing circuit that he probably would have survived the crash or at least not been as severely injured. Um, there were, at that time, autopsy photos were public in Florida, but the Earnhardt family went to court to stop their release. And ultimately the law was changed. They're not public anymore. Um, that was in the background too. And even right. though it had nothing to do with the Freedom of Information Act, it was one of those, the federal law, it was one of those things that was, you know, I think influencing the court's concerns. Um, that, and then finally, the well-known fact that certain convicted criminals do request these kinds of records pertaining to their own crimes and put them up in their jail cells and so forth. And people find that disturbing. So when you put all of these pieces together, it had very little to do, frankly, with the substance of this case and just a lot to do with the general atmosphere. Um, but that expansive interpretation of the personal privacy exemption um, is very, um, very, very problematic to me. Um, I mean, I suppose reasonable people can differ on whether Congress intended it or not. But again, I would have much preferred to see them explicitly say that if that was what they wanted to do. And you would imagine a person like Scalia would want the same. Uh, so well, do you, and, and he did. I think yeah, he did. Yeah. I mean, he, did, he, did he you, asked um, the question. Do you think that uh, that we're going to revisit this anytime soon? Do you see Do you see the court, something percolating back up and the court coming back to this? Well, I mean, it's, it's hard to say because the composition of the court has changed so drastically, um, certainly since 1989, but even since 2004. Um, I don't really know uh, what we're going to see. I mean, Amy Coney, Coney Barrett has written uh, an opinion in an FOI case and recently one of her first. And um, I don't know really what the, the current court's appetite is, but I can tell you that in my experience, getting involved with, with FOIA litigation over a, a long career, that generally speaking, the court does not take cases where the government won. They tend to just leave that intact. So most of the cases they're gonna take are the ones where the government lost in a court below. And most Freedom of Information Act cases, although certainly not all, are argued either in the DC circuit or in the Ninth Circuit in California. Mm -hmm. And this is largely, I mean, for DC, it's obvious, but you can actually bring a Freedom of Information Act case in any federal court that is convenient to you. So in theory, you could do it anywhere. But I think most litigants um, know and their advocates know that the Ninth Circuit and the DC Circuit are the most savvy ones in terms of, of interpreting the Freedom of Information Act. So whether you'll get the result you want it or not varies, of course, but at least you're going to have judges that are very familiar with the statute. <laughs> As you said, it's it's relatively straightforward, but there are a lot of nuances to it. And if you present it to a federal district judge who has never dealt with FOIA, you're probably going to get a, a pretty lousy ruling. So <laughs> that's where most of those cases are litigated. Um, but I guess to respond to your question, I think the point is that the Supreme Court doesn't take very many cases, period. They take very few Freedom of Information Act cases, although there have been a few since Roberts has been Chief Justice, but not that many. And they tend to only take them if the government was the loser and then their goal is to reverse it. So part of me says, I'd really rather they not start mucking around in the Freedom of Information Act because frankly, probably not a lot of good will come out of it. 
occasionally it does. There was a case involving the Federal Communications Commission and, and AT&T, where AT&T was trying to claim a personal privacy interest. And in a really short and punchy opinion, Justice Roberts says, sorry, you're not an entity that can have a personal privacy interest. You're a company. You may be a corporate person, but you're not going to be able to invoke uh, the Freedom of Information Act privacy exemptions. And he said, and I hope AT&T won't take it personally. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jane. It's, it's just fascinating to have someone who was actually sitting at counsel's table at the Supreme Court telling us about this case that, ha that has had such tremendous impact. So thank you. I really appreciate you being with us for this Media Law Chat. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. Bye-bye, Jane. Bye. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Bye-bye.